Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Good evening, friends, and welcome to this February 3rd, 2013 edition of Nightcast. Opening story tonight comes out of the United States, where huge swatches of the U.S. have been hit by heavy snowfall. Let's go for our opening story on this. It wasn't as though they needed any more snow in Massachusetts, but even more has fallen. This is the second heavy winter storm in less than a week. Yeah, we thought we were getting it off easy this winter because we haven't had much snow and all of a sudden we got the big blizzard and then this and it sounds like there's some more to come. So once it starts happening like this, that, you just settle in and you get ready for it. You get plenty of gas for the snowblower, get a few shovels ready to go and some hot chocolate. You're all set. In Boston, another foot of snow fell. It's caused disruption to thousands of flights. The New England Patriots did manage to get back home after their victory at the Super Bowl, but the weather has put the celebrations on hold their victory parade, postponed until Wednesday. The disruption caused by the storm has been felt across the northeast United States. Chicago saw one of the heaviest snowfalls on record for February. Treacherous road conditions caused a serious pileup, closing a main highway for several hours. February the 2nd is Groundhog Day. Crowds turned out in Pennsylvania to see the famous Punxsutawney Phil supposedly whisper his weather prediction for the next six weeks. He apparently saw his shadow, which means no early spring. Meanwhile, the mayor of Sun Prairie in Wisconsin got, well, more than a prediction. In Detroit, like in other places, many schools and businesses were shut. Hardly any cars to be seen on the streets of America's motor city. Winter storm warnings were in place for parts of Boston, Maine and New York State as the northeast of America remains in this icy grip. Ben Bland, BBC News. And friends, more on the uh, news. We've got a video that shows you some time lapse. I'm just going to pull it forward. Go ahead and roll it while I tell you about it. This time lapse video shows the gradual buildup of snow as residents in Poughkeepsie, New York, are hit by the U.S. blizzard. The fierce winter storm has caused disruption across the country as road conditions remain icy and treacherous. And then, friends, there's a very, there's a very um, serious news story I have for you next. Jordan has confirmed the death of the pilot Moaz al Kasabe after a video published online by Islamic State IS claimed to show him being burned alive. The country's King Abdullah has cut his visit to the United States short following news of Lieutenant Moaz Kasabe's death. In a statement, the king said that the pilot had died defending his beliefs, homeland, and nation. You can hear him now in this video. My dear brothers and sisters, the citizens and children of Jordan, we have received with great sadness, grief, and anger the news of the martyrdom of the hero pilot Muad al Kasasbe. May he rest in peace at the hands of the cowardly terrorist organization ISIS. It is a criminal deviant group which has no connection whatsoever with our great religion of Islam. Valiant pilot Muayyad died defending his beliefs, homeland and nation. He joins all the martyrs who made the ultimate sacrifice before him for dear Jordan. Today, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the family of the martyr hero Muayyad, with our people and our armed forces in this tragedy. At these difficult times, it is every Jordanian's duty to stand together in the face of crises and ordeals, which will only make us stronger. And friends, what I would uh, comment from that you may have noticed yourself in the uh, video is that uh, the king said that the IS Islamic State has no connection with the Islam religion as 
king, the king of Jordan knows it. Uh, well, that, that brings into question, is the Islam, Islam religion using the Quran as its Bible? And if so, there are verses, passages in that Quran that talk about killing infidels, killing those who are non-Islam. And that's what the Islamic State is basically operating under, that those passages in the Quran. And that's tied to the Islam religion. Now, Jordan has been for a long time a friend of the United States, a friendship that the United States would uh, do well and be wise to do everything it could to continue it. Of course, the best thing the United States could do to continue a friendship with people from uh, who are descendants of Ishmael in the many different... You know, Ishmael had 12 uh, chiefdoms that God said would come after him uh, that would become great chiefs of tribes. You know, he promised a blessing of many people to Ishmael, not numberless, as the promise was to Abraham and his son Isaac. But still, Ishmael would become a large number of people. They would basically become a thorn in the side of his brethren. And that, that, that not only meant his half-brother Isaac, that also <laughs> meant among themselves, among the tribes of Israel. Ishmael, as has happened, they have troubles between themselves. And um, even Egyptian against Egyptian. But uh, the best thing the United States and other the other tribes of Israel around the world in their modern-day locations, Ephraim in the United Kingdom and Canada, Reuben in France, and the other sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and his son, uh, and his 12 sons, one of whom was Joseph, who had the two sons who took Joseph's name as far as the blessing goes, and they are considered the two half-tribes of uh, among Israel, <clears throat> and that's Ephraim and Manasseh for the United Kingdom and the United States. But the best thing these tribes could do to um, have good relations with the uh, children of Ishmael would be to do as God says in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and that is diligently hearken to the voice of the Eternal and walk in His ways, His statutes, obey His commands, His voice. And then God promises all kind of blessings, including weather blessings, including national blessings, both agriculturally and and prospering and in terms of protection where five of you would chase a hundred of your enemy, a hundred of you would put 10,000 to flight. Now that's when, when we're obeying our creator. And the same chapters halfway through tell you if you don't, then just the opposite of those blessings, the curses, you'll be the tail, not the head. You'll be the borrower, not the lender. Your weather, forget it. I won't with a I won't. I won't stop these naturally occurring hurricanes and tornadoes and typhoons and tsunamis and earthquakes and things that are just built into the earth to come unless God intervenes, as He has for a long time in protection for the United States, as we basically had some kind of obedience going for Him. So if we want those blessings, we have to turn and diligently hearken to the voice of our Creator, which, friends, just look at the daily news. We are not. As a nation, as individuals, pornography reigns from this nation, worst in the world on that. We pass laws that are against what God says in the Bible is the correct way for marriage to be between goodness, Steve, how can you say this against the laws of your country between a man and a woman? Because I can say that because this is the law of the great God, our creator. And his law trumps all other law. And 
maybe for a temporary time, a nation will get away for a little bit, making laws that are contrary to those of our Creator. Uh, and yet he says in prophecy, one, one that people really should take note of is the one in Ezekiel 6, verse 6, where God says, your cities will be laid waste by your enemy. A prophecy that could never have been fulfilled before today, before since 1955, when nuclear weapons were first exploded, like the hydrogen bomb that can lay flat a whole city. And by the way, an atomic bomb like was dropped in Japan, that's, that's only the trigger for a hydrogen bomb. And God says, we continue our disobedience. All of your cities shall be laid waste. If I can get my Bible over here, let's take a look at, at uh, Ezekiel 6, verse 6. Just, we'll just read the first sentence of that verse. And good one to consider as you pray and as you think about the world news on um, what will prevent this from happening. And that is if we obey God. Here's what he says will happen if we don't obey him. In all your dwelling places, the cities shall be laid waste. And he says more, the high places shall be desolate, that your altars may be laid waste, your altars at which you worship the God of Baal and not the eternal great God who created the heavens and the earth and fashioned Adam from the dirt of the ground about 6,000 years ago. Now, the earth was already here. God just had to reef, clean it up and get things back in order after uh, Satan had come up to who was the God of this, who was ruling on this world as the God of this world after he got all of the angels under him, which we understand to be about one-third of all the angels, took them up to God's throne and tried to take over God's throne and got thrown back down here on this earth, creating a lot of havoc through the universe as he was thrown back here, craters on the moon, potholes here and there on various planets, and causing this world to become filled with gas and be flooded that was the flood before Noah's flood. That was the pre-Adamic flood. That was the flood caused by Satan, whose name had been Lucifer when he was ruling this earth in obedience to God. And when the earth was first created, if you read Job 38, you see it was created, the sons of men, the angels, they all shouted for joy when the earth was first created. It wasn't created, Tohu and Bohu, the condition it's found in in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, that happened some many thousands, maybe millions or billions of years after the earth was first created that Satan took his crew up to try to just to take over God's throne, got thrown back here, caused the earth to be flooded and and filled with all kind of gases, and it took our Creator to straighten that out again, which He did. Rebeautify the earth, recreated it about six thousand years ago. So those who try to teach you that this earth was created six thousand years ago, they 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 miss a few million or a few billion years between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. The, the real beginning of the Bible goes back, as Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong used to teach us, to John 1 and verse 1, where it says that, that uh, you know, I'm diverting from the news a little bit tonight because, you know, this was some pretty serious news. We're losing a friend in Jordan. Uh, Jordan... Uh, you know, there, a lot of nations are having to act on their own now who used to depend upon the United States and found that they could depend on the United States for helping settle things around the world. Not anymore. Our blessings of um, being the head and not the tail are being taken away because of the sins, not so much of our leaders. Our leaders are the result of the sins of the majority of the people in America. You know, sorry to call it like that, but you, you got to call a spade a spade, and that's the way it is, friends. It's not just on the heads of the leaders. The bad leadership we uh, 
sometimes get reflects the condition of the people of the country, whether they're obeying our Creator or not. But John 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And that's the real beginning as we're taught of the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All right, I've got another story related to this one story. This is the picture of the Jordanian pilot, uh, Lieutenant Moaz al kasaba who was burned alive. The uh, mood in Amman tonight, this next story says, friends, is furious. Jordan has confirmed the death of pilot Moaz al kasabeh after a video published online by Islamic State, IS, claimed to show him being burned alive. The video shows a man standing in a cage, engulfed in flames. Officials are working to confirm its authenticity. Jordan's king, Abdullah, Abdullah, as you just heard, hailed Lieutenant Kasesba as a hero, saying Jordan must stand united in the face of hardship. The pilot was captured when his plane came down near Raqqa, Syria, during a mission against IS in December. The video posted today was distributed via a Twitter account known as a source for IS propaganda. The highly produced 22-minute film includes a sequence showing the Jordanian pilot walking at gunpoint amidst rubble apparently caused by coalition airstrikes that targeted jihadists. BBC security correspondent Frank Gardner says that in a world already shocked by the calculated cruelty of Islamic State's actions, the, the horrific video, the horrific video is aimed primarily at Arab populations in Jordan and the Gulf states. Jordanian state television reports that Lieutenant Kasasba, 26 years old, was killed a month ago. Jordan had tried to secure his release since since then. The country has vowed punishment and revenge for his death, and the king described IS as a deviant criminal group. Jordan's king, Abdullah, uh, said, it is every Jordanian's duty to stand together. Now, you heard him. We played the video earlier with the king speaking. Jordan, which has joined the U.S.-led coalition against IS, had been attempting to secure Lieutenant Kasesba's release as part of a prisoner swap, offering to free Iraqi militant Sajida al-Rishkawi in exchange. She is a failed suicide bomber, now on death row in Jordan for her role in, a, in attacks in the capital um, Amman that killed 60 people in 2005. IS had sought Rishawi's release as part of a deal to free the Japanese captive journalist Kenji Goto. A video that appeared to show Goto's dead body appeared three days ago. And the caption with this photograph that's part of this news story, friends, reads... Relatives had gathered around Lieutenant Kasesbe's father in the center of this picture in Amman. Jordanians greeted the news with horror. Many have seen the gruesome video, barely edited, played over and over on television. Hundreds gathered in the streets after dark, demanding revenge against Lieutenant Cassess Bay's killers. Some also wanted to know why Jordan was involved 
in this fight at all. The pilot's father was among supporters when the news came through. He and other family members have left the capital to mourn at home. King Abdullah said Lieutenant Kasespa's Lieutenant Kasesbe had died defending his beliefs and homeland. The defense ministry said the pilot's blood would not have been shed in vain. It is promising a fitting punishment. I want to read that sentence again, friends. The defense ministry said the pilot's blood would not have been shed in vain. It's promising a fitting punishment. For many Jordanians, for many Jordanians, this has has to begin with the quick execution of Sajida al Rishawa, Sajida al Rishawi, the failed Al Qaeda suicide bomber, jailed ten years ago for her part in a spate of bombings against hotels in Jordan. A spokesman for the Jordanian Armed Forces said Lieutenant Kassesbe had fallen as a martyr. His blood will not be shed in vain, he said. Our punishment and our revenge will be as huge as the loss of the Jordanians. Jordanian officials were quoted as saying Rishawi would be executed immediately, along with three other convicted militants. And the caption with this photograph, part of this news story, friends, reads, Late today, on Tuesday, supporters of the pilot expressed their anger at a rally in Amman. And I have an analysis by BBC diplomatic correspondent Jonathan Marcus that I want to read to you, friends. He says, One thing is clear from this video. Islamic State never had any intention of releasing the young Jordanian pilot. According to Jordanian State media, he was killed on January the 3rd, well before the supposed prisoner exchange talks moved into high gear. The cynical manipulation of this episode by IS shows the importance it affords to information warfare. Here, an attempt to create problems for the Jordanian authorities and to weaken the Arab-Western coalition at a time when it appears to be struggling to make dramatic headway against IS on the ground. This is the problem for the coalition. Its air campaign is in many ways a stopgap intended to halt the progress of IS, but requiring effective troops on the ground to significantly turn back its advance. Now, that's the end of the BBC analysis. Back to the news story portion of this, friends. Jordan's King Abdullah is calling short, is cutting short a visit to the United States. We mentioned that earlier. He cut it short after news of Lieutenant Cassess Bay's death, but he met President Barack Obama this evening, earlier tonight, before flying home. Mr. Obama earlier said in a statement that if the video was real, it would be, quote, one more indication of the viciousness and barbarity of IS. Well, that's been proved a long time ago. I think it will redouble the vigilance and determination on the part of the global coalition to make sure they are degraded and ultimately defeated, he added. The Jordanian king has already met U.S. Vice President Joe Biden, who reinforced America's ironclad support for Jordan, the White House said. Hmm. Be nice to hear that kind of support going for Israel, too, wouldn't it, friends? Or at least words to that effect. Um, here's a timeline. We'll close with this, friends. The Jordanian pilot held hostage on December 24 last year. Jordanian 
uh, Jordanian Lieutenant Moaz Yosef al Kesabe was captured by IS after his plane crashes. On the 25th of December, his, the pilot's father urges IS to show mercy. On January 20 this year, IS threatens to kill two Japanese hostages unless Japan pays $200 million ransom within 72 hours. On January 24, four days later, the IS releases video of Japanese hostage Kenji Goto holding a picture apparently showing Haruna Yukawe's decapitated body. Same day, January 24, IS calls for release of Sajida al-Rishawi, an Iraqi militant sentenced to death in Jordan. Then four days after that, on January 28, Jordan offers to release Rishawi in exchange for Lieutenant Kassez Bey. Then the next day, January 29, the deadline to kill Lieutenant Kassess Bay and Mr. Goto expired. On January 31st, two days after that, the video was released, appearing to show Kenji Goto's body. Then today, friends, the video was released, appearing to show Lieutenant Kassess Bay burnt alive, with Jordanian media suggesting he was killed weeks earlier. That's it, friends, for I've got other video, but um, I tell you what, let's uh, hang in there with me. Let's, let's show this very, let's don't end on a heavy heart story. Although, don't forget the story. It, 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 we are instructed by Jesus Christ in Luke 21, verse 36, to watch and pray. And before you go to bed tonight, I hope you'll pray for our Jordanian Half brothers, you know they are the uh, the descendants of Ishmael, are half brothers to the descendants of Isaac, um, because Isaac and Ishmael had the same father. They both had Abraham as their father. They had different mothers. Isaac had Sarah for his mother. Ishmael had the Egyptian handmaid of Sarah, Hagar, as as his mother. And, but same father. So they are step brothers. Or actually, excuse me, they are, well, they're half brothers. And at the moment, I need to clarify, I need to go re clarify the difference between step brother and half brother again. But I think it's half brother. And, and one or the other, they're half brother or step brother to us, that we both have the same father, Abraham. And so it'd be good if we pray for those people tonight because a great insult has occurred against them and they're hurting. And uh, let's pray for them and, uh, and for, the, for some kind of peace to continue uh, to the point where God decides he's going to let it all go and we get to the point where Europe comes together in a ten-nation com combine that's five from the east, five from the west, giving their power to the seventh and final head of the Holy Roman Empire that the Bible calls the beast. And, you know, I've, I've, I haven't put our chart up for a while, and I have that chart over here. Uh, over here. And uh, I think we can pull that forward even a little bit more. Let's see. No. Uh, but you see, there's four seals that have been very active, and they're most of the things we follow here in the news. And the fifth seal, you can see it there, is the Great Tribulation seal. I think I can pull that in a little tighter for you here, friends. We have four seals that represent false religion as the first seal, the second seal, the red horse of war and rumors of war, the third seal of famine, the fourth seal of pale horse of disease epidemics and trouble including weather upsets. And when all of these escalate to a certain point, then the fifth seal, when Europe picks ahead, those ten nations, it boils down to ten nations or regions that pick ahead that is 
crowned by the Pope, the woman in the Bible, that woman picturing symbolically a false prophet, who, who crowns this seventh and final head of the Holy Roman Empire in the Emperor's Hall in Frankfurt, Germany, and then commences a great martyrdom of saints, according to the Bible. They call this new head of the beast, working in conjunction with the false prophet. It'll be the beginning of World War III. It'll be the beginning of uh, two witnesses performing a witness around the world. And at that time, also that three-and-a-half-year period, the people who are doing what Christ said do in Luke 21, 30, will be taken to a place in the wilderness that God has prepared east of that riverway between Lake Tiberias and the, the Dead Sea in a triangulation that God described through Daniel in Daniel 11, verses 40 and 41, the land of the children of Ammon, big in the news tonight, Ammon, Jordan, and Moab, and and one more. And uh, I'm having a brain fault. I'll look it up real quickly for us, friends. It's... Uh, all of that's just east of that waterway between Lake Tiberias and, um, and, the, and the Dead Sea. You can look that up yourself in your own Bible, too. Daniel 11, verses 41, 42. And then look up where these areas are on a map, a, a good biblical map, so you can see they're all, hey, there, there is a triangulation, an area which encompasses where Petra is. And... Since all this stuff could come together, friends, I'm pushing it for us because all of a sudden we, we may find this time of the 1,335 days, the 1,290 days, and the 1,260 days upon us. And it's going to come as a surprise to, to many people. At the time of the end shall the king of the south, verse 40, Daniel 11, push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, of course, that's symbolic language for today's military style of weaponry. And, with, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Verse 41, he shall enter into the glorious land, which everybody's fighting over now. That's Jerusalem. And many countries shall be overthrown. Now, they're fighting over it, but they haven't put armies around it yet, thankfully, because that, that, that starts a clock to roll when the armies surround Jerusalem. But these shall escape out of the hand of that king of the north, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So that's the other one, Edom. Uh, so that triangulation area there, Moab, Edom, and the children of Ammon, Petrus, right in that triangulation. But I, it, but there's other land in that triangulation too. So I'm, I'm not saying it will be Petra. It, but Petra is in that protected area. All right. I said I close on something light. Let's go for it. Birds take in, take it in turns to lead. Say scientists. Scientists have worked out how flocking birds solve what they've termed the social dilemma of who leads the flock. Well, this ought to be good for a lot of people. <laughs> the researchers from the UK, Germany, and Austria studied the northern bald ibis, tracking how they, like so many large birds, fly in a V formation. You'll see that in this video. They found that birds took it in turns to take the very energy-depleting lead. This allowed every bird, every bird, to take advantage of extra lift produced by the wings of the bird in front. The findings are published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Victoria Gill has this most interesting report. For large, heavy birds like the swans and geese, here at Martin Mere, flying can be tough. It consumes so much energy that many don't survive their first winter migration. So scientists have been studying some very unusual birds to find out how a familiar formation can help. 
Just like geese, these critically endangered northern bald ibises fly in a V, getting vital extra lift from an upwash of air off the wings of the bird in front. The aim of this study was to find out how the birds solved the dilemma of which one takes the very tiring lead. The scientists worked with a conservation team in Austria who've trained these captive bred birds to migrate. They fitted each ibis with a GPS data logger to monitor their movements as they flew. This showed that the birds worked in pairs, taking it in turns to lead and to follow. By essentially pairing up with one other member of the flock, the birds were able to have their formation constantly shift around like a cycling peloton, allowing every ibis a much needed rest. And it seems we could learn energy saving lessons from these birds. It's really interesting from a conservation stand because the more we know about the birds, the better we can help conserve them. But also from us as humans, the information we're getting from studying these birds is helping airline companies to see how they can save fuel, which obviously saves us a little bit of money when we're flying all around the world. The researchers think this simple method, working in twos and taking turns, could be the mechanism behind much more crucial cooperation in the animal kingdom. Victoria Gill, BBC News. All right, friends, and there, there's one one minute thing. If you got to go, I understand. So long. See you tomorrow night. But if you got another minute to stick with us here, I've got a video that's about one minute long. Might stretch it a little longer if I pause it to read to you. That shows something from Leviticus 26. I think verse 19 that talks about where God says, "If you don't obey me, not only will I curse you and then curse you seven times more, but then I will break the pride of your power." And friends, to see where we are with that, both in the United States, the modern-day descendants of Manasseh, and in the UK, the modern-day descendants of Ephraim. I'm going to play this uh, story. i got to be sure, and it, I don't have a license for the music that is with this story, so we'll just play the video part of it, cut the uh, audio part, the music out of it, and I'll just read the, the captions to you and try to slow them down so you can see them easy. Uh, Fiji is to remove the UK's Union Jack from its flag, Prime Minister of, of that country has announced. The Commonwealth Pacific nation gained independence from Britain in 1970. The leader of the country said it was time to dispense with the colonial symbols. BBC News considers the position of other nations which feature the Union Jack on their flags. This video was produced by Sarah Barman, and let's have a look. Fiji is to remove the UK's Union Jack from its flag. Pacific nation gained independence from Britain in 1970 and now wants to dispense with colonial symbols. The flag features sugar cane, bananas, a palm tree, and a dove of peace. Three other former British colonies still retain the Union flag. New Zealand is holding a referendum in 2016 on whether to replace its flag. Prime Minister John Key says the design symbolizes a colonial era whose time has passed. Mr. Key likes the silver fern design used by All Blacks team. Australia's Foreign Minister J Julie Bishop says no great demand to change the flag. We have competed in Olympic Games under that flag, and there's a sense of pride in it. Polynesian nation Tuvalu has not announced any plans to remove the Union flag. One star was briefly removed as the country's name means eight together. That referred to the number of islands originally inhabited. And 
that's that little video there that I wanted to be sure that you saw before we close out tonight. Friends, that's it for this Tuesday evening report. God willing and the sheep don't rise, we'll be back again tomorrow night, Wednesday evening, with the day's current news. There's some things happening in France. I'll have video on for you. Sad thing to report. A stabbing of some of the military people uh, by some terrorists there. So many things to pray about. Many things. We'll, we'll cover that story fully tomorrow night. God willing, and the creek don't rise. Until next time, friends, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, saying so long and good night, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.